Now, there are a few things in life that uh, enact memories of childhood, like a swing set or a juice box. And if you're like me, you've probably had more juice boxes than you can count, and you've probably used a straw more times than you can count. And really, without a straw, a juice box probably wouldn't be that easy to drink, would it? But have you ever actually wondered? Hmm. Okay, let's see what you can do. You've probably been using a straw for years and years upon years of your life. But it's one of those things that you don't necessarily sit down and think about. So go ahead, try and explain to me how a straw works. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. Now, this isn't a magic trick, right? We, we didn't set this up. I would wager that you probably, somewhere already in your explanation, assuming you talk to your computer screen, use the word suck. Well, I'm going to put one little stipulation in you being able to explain how a straw works. You can't use the word suck. That's right. Nothing sucks in science. Say it with me. Nothing sucks in science. So, we can't use the term suck to explain how a straw works. So, now give it a go. Not as easy, right? Well, in order to explain how a straw works without using the term suck, we have to take a look at the thing that actually does cause a straw to work, and that is air pressure. And you've probably heard air pressure or the term barometric pressure before if you've seen a weather report or you've watched the Weather Channel, because I know you're that exciting. And you've probably heard reference to air masses moving in or pressure changes, things like that. Well, air pressure is just that. So let's take a look at what air pressure might mean by first understanding what pressure is. Now, pressure by its own definition is the force per unit area. So if we think about air, that is the gas that's surrounding us right now, or the mixture of gases that's surrounding us right now, we have all of these particles colliding against us, billions upon billions upon billions of particles per second colliding on us, that is exerting air pressure, or what we kind of call atmospheric pressure, on us just by the collision of these molecules against us, the object. Well, let's try and depict this a little bit. So if we take a look at a balloon, a balloon that's filled up with air, the reason that the balloon expands is because it is being filled with air. And these air particles are constantly moving and colliding against the side of the container. The greater the number of collisions, the greater the pressure. So when we talk about air pressure and we talk about these collisions, we're just dealing with the air particles that are moving and colliding against the sides of the container. In this case, it's a balloon. But it could be any container. In fact, it could be any object. Because as we stand here, as I've stated, we have all of these air particles that are colliding against us. That is, unless the object is in a vacuum, it's coming in contact with the particles that surround it. And when we take a look at air, for example, as I said, air is a mixture of gases. So all of the gases that are in the air, and it's primarily nitrogen and uh, lower levels of oxygen and trace amounts of other things like carbon dioxide and argon, but all of these molecules are coming together to exert pressures. And when we deal with molecules that compose a mixture of gases, what we're dealing with is we have pressures of all of these individual gases. We refer to these in a mixture of gases as partial pressures. So if we're going to take a look at the total pressure that air exerts on an object, we have to take a look at the sum, or that is we have to add up, all of the individual pressures of those gases. So we have to add up the pressure that oxygen contributes. We have to add up the pressure that nitrogen contributes, and so on. And the total pressure of that gas of air is the sum of the partial pressures of all of the individual gases. So if we were blowing air into the balloon, we would have all of these different molecules, nitrogen and oxygen, that are colliding against the sides of the container. And if we think about it, the more particles that are in there, they're moving around constantly colliding with the side of that container, and that's exerting a force, a pressure, a collision against that side of the container. So if we've come to understand that air pressure is just a measure of all of the collisions of the particles or molecules in the air against the side of a container or against an object, there must be some way to measure these collisions. And there is. The way that we measure atmospheric pressure, air pressure, is through a device that we call a barometer. And just very quickly, the way that a barometer works can be illustrated by looking at a crude mercury barometer, one in which there is a container at the bottom where there is a uh, pool of mercury that's exposed to 
the air, and then there is an inverted column of mercury that's supported by this air pressure. So that when the air pressure increases, it is going to push down on the exposed mercury. There is very little uh, compression in the mercury, so the only place for it to go is up that inverted tube, and we can see the level rise. So as the atmospheric pressure rises, so does the level of the mercury in the tube. If the air pressure is to decrease, it's not going to be able to support as much mercury, and so the mercury level will drop, and the mercury level in the uh, tub will rise, and so what we will see is the lowering of that level to correspond with a lower atmospheric pressure. Now because this is mercury and because these increments are moving down by millimeters or can be measured as moving down by millimeters, one of the ways that we can measure um, atmospheric pressure changes is in millimeters of mercury. However, this is not the standard unit that we use for pressure. The standard unit that we use is kilopascals, um, or more accurately pascals, but we use kilopascals. But all of these pressure units can be converted between. And you are going to come across a few. You might come across atmospheres, or you might come across tor, but there are conversions for all of these units. So tor and millimeters of mercury are the same, but every 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere, which is equal to 101.3 kilopascals. So really, as long as you have your conversion skills, you can convert between any one of these pressure units. So now you have all the tools that you need to explain how a straw works. Thanks for watching. No? Not quite? Well, I guess I got some time. We can work through this. Okay, did you understand how a barometer worked? Well, I, I, I can't hear you. So I'm going to assume that you kind of understood how a barometer worked. Well, if we understand pressure and we understand how a barometer works, even a little bit, we can probably start to explain how a straw works. And if we think about a straw as we put it into a liquid and just leave it there, what you're going to notice is that the level of liquid in the straw, that is in the plastic cylinder that represents our straw, and in the cup that holds the liquid, those levels of liquid are going to be the same. And the straw itself, above that level of liquid, is going to be filled with air, and the container itself is going to be filled with air, and the air inside the straw and the air inside the liquid container is probably the same pressure. So the liquid levels are going to be the same. Now when you put your mouth over the straw and close your mouth over the straw, you're creating a seal. Now, you're not sucking here, remember? Nothing sucks in science. But what you are doing is breathing in, and by breathing in, you're expanding your thoracic cavity, your chest cavity, your lungs get larger. The volume of the lungs get larger. Now what do you think happens to the pressure of the air that's in your lungs if the volume gets larger? Now we're going to talk about this a little more when we get into gas laws, but I think you already understand this relationship. As the volume of air gets larger, or the volume of your lungs gets larger, the pressure in your lungs goes down. Now, if the pressure in your lung goes down, the pressure of the air in the straw is now greater than the pressure of the air in your lungs, and so gases, and air, being a gas, will move from areas of high pressure to low pressure. Think about a balloon. If you have a balloon and you blow it up, what do we know about the pressure of the air inside the balloon versus outside the balloon? Well, if you let it go, you're going to find out. Air moves from areas of high pressure to low pressure. And so as a result, the air moves from the straw into your lungs. But now, there is less air in that straw, less pressure in that straw. Outside the straw, the air pressure is acting on the surface of that liquid. And so what happens is that that air pressure, which is now greater than the pressure inside the straw, pushes that liquid down, just like our liquid barometer. And what happens is, since that liquid is has a low compressibility, it is going to go up the straw and into your mouth. And if you think about this, think about having a broken straw. Or think about trying to suck through a straw without completing a seal around the straw. It doesn't work very well, does it? That's because air rushes in and equalizes the pressure so that the liquid cannot be forced up the straw. Do you have a better idea of how a straw works now? Well, again, it all has to do with pressure, air pressure atmospheric pressure, all of the collisions of those kilometers high of atmospheric gases that are interacting with us in every single object. Billions of collisions upon billions of collisions upon billions of collisions per second. All of those things create the atmospheric pressure, the air pressure, that's necessary to use a straw.
Thanks for watching.